Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Like a Conversations. Thank you so much for being us, with us today. Uh, before I introduce you to our guest today, a little bit of a housekeeping. You'll see that in the Zoom window, there is a chat function uh, on the right-hand side. We invite you to share with us where you're tuning in from. And this is also a great place for you to ask questions uh, to our guests today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Maine Kinimaka. Maine, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to see you. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on here and excited to chat a little bit about the project that we made. Perfect. Um, well, before we get started on the project, I would love for you to share a little bit more about where are you coming from and a little bit about your creative story with us. Um, so, o mai ni aloha kirimaka ko no anohola kawa i mai au. Uh, aloha mai kako, my name is mai ni aloha kirimaka, and I am from Anohola on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. Um, so, I got the opportunity this year to work with Laika for the launch of their SL3. So, this project is um, o Hawaii mako, which means we are, we are all Hawaii, and it's basically... Um, just about my passion for photography through my family and through Hawaii, and um, super excited to share some images with you guys today. Well, let's look at them now. We'll turn on the slides here and look at the first shots. Looks like the first shot is with uh, your father, Titus, and with uh, Kehu. Would you mind sharing a little more about this image right here? Yeah. So when the whole project kind of came to beginnings, I was really excited to and honored to be able to test this camera and use this camera for the first time. So previously in the past, I had worked with uh, the Leica SL2 and also using the Leica SL2S and I loved everything about it, the video and the photo. So when the SL3 came along and I had it in my hands, I was like blown away, not only like by how it feels with the size and being like slightly smaller than SL2, but the detail and everything. So Coming into the opportunity to create a story along with the SL3, my first instinct was kind of just to go to the roots of why I love photography. And it's all about storytelling and storytelling about my ohana, my family, and Hawaii, because that's what I just love the most. So starting off with this photo, to me, this was the most one of the most significant photos of the project because of everything it's going to represent for my family generations from now. So this image is my father, Titus Nihi Kinimaka, and he's steering our family va'a, so our canoe. Um, and then in the front paddling with him is Te Kehu Kehu Butler, which is my partner. And he's from Aotearoa. And they are paddling our va'a in Hanalei Bay. So this beach here and this water is where I learned how to swim. It's where I learned how to surf. It's where my dad surfed and learned how to surf. And the mountain range behind them is kind of like the backdrop to my childhood and everything that we all kind of come from together. So if you look at my dad, he's steering the canoe and the paddle that he has with him is actually the same paddle that he inherited from his older brother, who is an incredible waterman that taught him everything he knows. So to me, like this image at face value, when you look at it, it's really powerful. You see these like two powerful men and they're in this va'a and it's kind of encompassing the whole frame. But to me, there's so many different layers upon this image that if you are in our family or if you know anything about my father and kind of like the legacy that he's created as far as being a waterman that I've been really fortunate to inherit, there's so many different layers to the story. And I think that's something that I love about photography, especially because it has such an ability to capture so many little details and nuances in in history. So yeah, this is um, one of my favorite images from the whole project, just for many reasons. And we'll talk about you know the importance of the environment and the landscape and some of these upcoming images. But I agree with you. I love just the the scene that you you have in front of us, we have like our, our, our main two kind of protagonists in this in this shot here, while you also have this environment behind it with all the fog and mist, really beautiful shot. Let's continue looking at some more images here. 
Um, looks like we have some close-ups of your father, Titus. Uh, is this the paddle that you were describing just a couple months earlier? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the same paddle that my dad got from his older brother, Leleo Kinimaka. Um, and it's, for me, it's such a powerful image to have him there with the paddle because I'm going to be having that paddle for the rest of my life. It's an incredible paddle. Like when you hold it in real life, all of the detail, like you can really feel that it has had this life of its own. And, you know, years from now, my kids or my grandkids, we're definitely going to still have that paddle. And for them to be able to hold that paddle in their hands, even if, you know, my dad is long gone, is something that is extremely powerful to me. Um, I really wanted to capture my dad paddling because, so for context, my father grew up um, here on Kobai and he learned everything about the ocean from his mom, his dad, and his older brothers and sisters. So in Hawaii, everybody has a very close connection with the Aina or the Kai in whatever different ways. I think a lot of people kind of assume everybody in Hawaii knows how to hula, they know how to dance, or they know how to do this and this. But there are people who know everything across the board, but there are also ohana that know very specific stuff, um, whether it be relating to mahi ai to farming or aina or kai. So my family comes from a really strong lineage of people who have always been involved with the sea. So my dad is um, a big wave surfer. So as he progressed through his life, he just really loved to surf the biggest, scariest, craziest waves that he could, which I can't relate to, but I've done it a little bit and it's definitely, I can understand why he he chases that that sensation. But um, even though he does all of these amazing things, he's an amazing surfer, he's always in the ocean, he can read the ocean incredibly. I specifically wanted to shoot him in this va'a because the va'a is such an important, the canoe is such an important thing to all Polynesian people. doesn't matter if you're from Hawaii, it doesn't matter if you're from Tahiti, from Aotearoa. That is the common denominator of the one thing that took us across all of the Pacific as we dispersed throughout Polynesia. And him being the patriarch of our family, I found it very powerful to choose to photograph him in his va'a with his paddle, just for the symbolic reason of like, he's he's steering our ohana and he's steering that next generation. And he is the alaka'i and the leader of the ba'a that is gonna be our ohana. So um, I could have taken photos of him doing kind of anything in the ocean, but I thought this and especially his personal love for it was the thing that I wanted to photograph him doing. So when I see the photo of him steering, there's so many different levels to why it's significant to me. Um, and I think everybody has such a different interpretation of images. And it's nice to get the context of everything beyond the face value. That's one of the things that I love the most. And I love the, the presence of water throughout these images. I, I love how that's a constant theme that you're seeing through these shots here. Uh, I want to direct your attention to the left-hand shot with uh, the portrait with the paddle. There is water behind, you know, Titus. Um, is there is this a long exposure? It seems like there's motion in that water behind him. Could you tell a little bit more about how you achieved this image? Yeah, so we were shooting in the morning and we're this image on the left, actually, and the image on the right, this is in the river before you go out into the ocean. So in this first image on the left, he's sitting on the canoe and I have the water moving behind him. But because it is a river, the water moves like quite straight and linearly. And the reflection of the sunrise just coming off of the water kind of gives that effect. But the light, it was a cloudy day, as you can see in the second image. So it's not like a very harsh, it's a kind of a subdued light. But I found on using the SL3, the parts of the photo that are out of focus are sometimes the most interesting parts of the photo because the bokeh and the detail, especially when using different lenses and vintage lenses, provides this like 
really, really, really interesting detail that was super exciting to me. The first time I actually ever used the camera, I had um, a screw on 100 um, lens and I just had it wide open. It was probably, it's just about blue light. So the sun was almost, light was almost completely gone. And I was shooting some portraits and it was the same thing where the water was behind the subject and it had that effect, but it looked like film because of that like detail that I don't think you can ever really replicate on film, even if you're doing any type of editing, like, and it had that effect, even though it is a digital camera with the lens, like it just gave that really emotive texture. So that's what's going on in the background. Long-winded answer, but yeah, I've been loving everything that I've been getting from the camera as far as using different lenses and, and all of the details that kind of aren't the main subject of the photo. I love that. Let's explore more of that in the following images. We got some more portraits. Uh, do you mind sharing who these people are? We, we already met Titus, Titus, of course. Yeah. So on the left, my father, Titus, again. Um, this was taken at the same time as that previous image on the left. And then to the right of him, I have my auntie Li Hue, so my dad's sister. Um, my dad has 16 brothers and sisters all together. Um, there's two mothers, so eight from what they call the first batch <laughs> and then eight from the second batch. So my dad is a part of the second batch um, as well as auntie Li Hue. So when I first started kind of being interested in photography, um, I was maybe 13 or 14 years old. And it was due to the fact that we were just about to have a really big family reunion. So as you can imagine, with my dad having 16 brothers and sisters, our family reunions are pretty big. There's thousands of us all together um, from not only Hawaii, but who have moved to other parts of the world as well. So it's nice to get everyone back together. And at the time I was noticing, you know, quite a few of them were beginning to age. And being somebody who was interested in photography and also kind of just being a naturally nostalgic person, I was like, man, I, I really wanna get photos of everybody, like as many photos as I can of all of my aunties and uncles, because they're all so unique in all the different things that they did, all of the different like me Hawaii that they participated in. So my auntie Li Hue, like when I think about her, she's the provider of our family as far as food. She's the one that's always taking care of everybody. She's the one that's always cooking, making sure everybody's fed. She's really, really selfless. And so I had um this series kind of when I was really young of a bunch of my family members and I've just continued it throughout the years and have just tried to continue taking photos of people throughout like the different stages of their life. But um, so this is my auntie Li Hue on the right. And I had like a big thing at my house, a big dinner to get everybody to come over to get some more photos of um, everybody kind of as they age and their grandchildren age. Um, and so she's she's a very special person, auntie Li Hue. She's very strong. Is this uh, image right here part of that same uh, same moment that you're describing where everybody came to the house? Yeah. So this is the same moment. So this is my auntie Li Hue's grandsons, just a few of them. There's tons of them. And my father, Titus. Um, so this image, there's tons of very beautiful stoic imagery, but I love this photo, especially because it's, I think, far more representative of how people are majority of the time, uh, especially Hawaiians, we love to laugh and, Try not to take too many things too seriously if we can. But, you know, these boys are crack up. They're just young kids, cheeky, super, very smart, but, you know, athletic and just just fun little boys to be around. And my dad is very much the same way, even though he's 69 years old. So I thought this image was really cool. And it's like, you know, there's this huge age gap in these generations of our Ohana, but at the same time, like that sentiment of, play and um, just lightness is still going through the age differences. It's like it's nothing. So yeah, my dad definitely, I think, looks like the biggest kid of all of them in, in this whole photo. And funny enough, um, they're actually laughing at um, Tekehukehu, who is in the previous image, who is behind me like dancing and just being a fool as he usually is. But 
yeah, it it kind of says a lot, I think, about about um our men and and just how we are. What a beautiful moment. Uh, let's dive into some more portraits of uh, these kids that you just mentioned. Um, they seem to be incredible surfers based on the the shots that we're seeing here on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, so these three boys are my cousins. So Auntie Lee, who is grandchildren. Um, and it's really beautiful for me to see them because as I was saying about the lineage of my family being having a really strong connection with uh, the ocean and with surfing, these boys are so young and they're for me kind of the first generation that I get to see doing what I did. And when you're a kid and you're just playing in the ocean, you're really unconscious of what you're doing. But then as an adult family member looking at them, I'm like, wow, that's incredible for them to be the age that they are doing what they're doing is astounding and thinking that that's just going to keep building and building through time. I'm really, really proud of what they're doing to continue on our family's traditions. And beyond that, they're really good, good boys. They're so kind they have so much aloha their whole family their mom and their dad are incredible really smart so what they're um have here is an alaya surfboard which is actually what is also behind me so an alaya is the basis upon which what we know as modern day surfing was founded so um the alaya were made by native hawaiian kanaka maui and they're carved out of very select trees that grow here in Hawaii. And it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of generations have passed down to understand how to carve the board perfectly, to float, have speed, all of these incredible factors, which truly are like a testament of, of time. But surfing, you know, Hawaiians have a huge part in establishing the sport of surfing. So this is kind of where it's all started here. So um, on the left, we have uh, Kiakaha, he's the oldest cousin, and he has the alaya with him. This is just as he's come out of the ocean. And then on the right, there is the three boys together. Um, and I just felt that that was a really cool, I love the framing, being able to see the ages of the boys kind of progressing and seeing all of their profiles um, was a really interesting, uh, really interesting I guess, point of view to view the image from, but these boys can fully ride these boards. Uh, the youngest one is like no older than five or six years old. And he's surfing on this traditional wooden board, which most people today at, you know, their full professional surfing peak would still sometimes have trouble riding. So um, this is really representative of how our keiki today, our children are doing so much without even knowing to kind of progress our culture and uphold our traditions. That's incredible. I'm uh, seeing a couple uh, questions from the chat already. Uh, we shared a couple images in black and white. We have some images here in color. The question is, do you find yourself converting more images to black and white that are documenting your family? And if so, why? Yes, I, I think I do very frequently. And I think that everybody kind of has an understanding of when you put something in black and white, you're really focusing on who, like it really just dials in your attention to the emotion of the image rather than kind of getting distracted by so many other factors. You're just going straight into the emotion on the face, the detail, the action. And I, I do find myself playing with black and white a lot. In fact, when I started photography, that was kind of primarily the first thing that I I was ever doing when I was in school um, and learning how to, you know, develop your own film and stuff in black and white was kind of the easiest thing to do for over color. So yeah, I do it a lot, but I try to, I'm trying my best to actually kind of switch it around and break out of that habit, but then also find, I think my thing now is trying to find ways to photograph in color, but also kind of like drawing all the color back as far as finding how to photograph in front of things that are more visually metaphorical, but but very um, like there's not they're not too busy. So yeah, I do find myself doing that quite a bit. Another question from the chat is, what lenses are you using for these images? So these two images here are the twenty four to ninety, um, and I use that cam I use that lens a lot. 
So day to day, if I'm kind of just popping out and I don't really know exactly what I'm going to shoot, but I know I'm going to be encountering, you know, something that I want to shoot, something cultural or encountering a certain person that I've been trying to get photos of, but I don't know where I'm going to shoot them. And it's kind of impromptu. I always have that lens with me just to be able to have the variety, but I often use that lens and then just go all the way to 90 and just to compress for portraits. That's kind of my, my go-to and my favorite, which most of these images, especially these two here, are either at 75 or 90. It's nice to have that extra reach when you need it, especially like you said for portraits, because it really just dissolves the background like we've been seeing here at these images. Really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Let's move forward with the next image. Looks like we have some of the, the same boys. Yeah. So this here is the same boys and their parents. So that's their father, um, Kaleo, and his wife, Jackie. Kaleo is my cousin. Um, and they have also, you know, Kaleo himself is, he's an incredible lifeguard. He's an incredible waterman. Um, as far as water safety, he is one of the best. Um, rescuing anybody he's so selfless and he really really knows the ocean and I think it's a great example for the boys but this image here kind of just looks like a family photo which it is but um it's at the beach where we are all from and this is if you know this place you know this is kind of like the hub I feel at least the hub for Kanaka Maoli on Kauai especially on the north and east sides of the island and these pillars will be so iconic and recognizable to, I think, a lot of Hawaiians and Kanaka Maoli here. And to me, it screams my childhood and everything that we were kind of raised on. So there was kind of no other place in my mind to shoot them um, for this image. But I was uh, explaining to Nathan, um, because he did ask what these pillars are in the back. So it's actually the remnants of what used to be up here. So Anahola, where I am from, is um, Hawaiian homelands, which is similar, quite similar concept to what many people kind of think of Native American reservations in America. Um, so formerly, before it was Department of Hawaiian Homelands, it was a sugar plantation, as were many places in Hawaii, especially on Kauai. And those sugar plantations are had a huge hand in the colonization of Hawaii, but those sugar plantations are no more. And now where they once stood, Hawaiians are living. So this is kind of, you know, in a way, a representation of Hawaiians and the thought of like, we are still here. We are still not only here, but we are growing and we're revitalizing and not, not even revitalizing. We're just holding steady um, the things that we have. So there's a lot of meaning to this photo as most of my photos have had long and lengthy explanations, but um, yeah, that's what those pillars in the back are if you were curious. I love that. And I especially love this image right here. We talked a little bit about this a couple of days ago and in the context, I would love for you to share more about this shot. Yeah, so this is Kiakaha. Um, Kia for short, and the same boy from the portrait before. So I was explaining to Nathan, so this is just what kind of comes off as a simple portrait of my cousin here with his alaya, and he's in the water waiting for a wave. But when I see this photo, I don't think of it as a portrait of one person. To me, I see it as a portrait of two people, and the other person in this portrait is the Mauna, the mountain behind him, which is called Kalalea. Uh, and that is the main Mauna in Anhola, the Ahupua'a, or the place that I'm from, in the Hawaiian homelands that um, I'm from. And so in Hawaii, anything that comes before you, we regard as a kupuna, or somebody who is your elder. And what that means is that person or thing, like it deserves your respect and it deserves your care. So this mountain here is extremely significant for many, many reasons. Um, there are tons of heiau or temples, Hawaiian temples, in this area that are really significant to things like timekeeping, fishing. This whole area of Anhula is a vahipana, which is a place that's important to us 
for many different fishing and agriculture and all these mo'olalo or stories. So when I see this photo, it's Kia, but also with our kupuna of Kalalea in the background. And why that's significant is because our kids and our cousins and everybody in our family, if they see this photo a hundred years from now, you know, and Kia is an old tutu, he's an old grandma or grandpa already, you know, they're still gonna see Kalalea in the background and they're gonna be able to relate to that today. They can go stand in the same exact place and surf the exact same wave as Kia surfing right now and know that their kupuna Kia was doing the exact same thing. So to me, that's that's kind of the power of when I look around my landscape in Hawaii, I think it's really, really beautiful and people around the world, it's renowned for its natural beauty. Just obviously you look at it and you're taken aback, but as a Hawaiian, we see so much more when we look at mountains, when we look at beaches, when we look at the kayo, the ocean, everything has a story. And that's very enriching. And it's a part of our history. And it's really important that we are able to foster that and then also pass it on. So yeah, there's so many stories. And I think people, anyone from Kauai or, or from Anahola will look at that photo and you know they'll have their own story that they can put onto that image. So yeah, in a way, one of my favorite photos. I think it's so important to document not only the people around you, but also the spaces that they are in. And like you said, having something that doesn't change very often, like this landscape here, um, I think is a good reference point, like you said, for other people that uh, you know, tells their story as well and, and, and adds to the big story that is happening uh, in this space here. A really beautiful, beautiful shot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Next image right here, looks like we have a close-up of uh, Kai Kala. Yep. Yep. So this is, this is Kai Kala. Um, this is the youngest brother of them all. And I love this image just because I feel like it really expresses beyond what I'm saying of all this, like, you know, feels a bit heavier. You know, you've got to preserve this and pass this on and it's really serious and this and that. Like, when it comes down to it, we're all kids playing in the ocean. And that's the thing that we love the most. And that's what's going to help us continue these things. And, you know, a lot of the time it isn't very serious. And um, I just love this photo of him in, and what it kind of expresses for the same thing. Because um, this was could totally have been my dad when he was this age and was probably me at this age and, you know, everybody else. So I think it's like that common thread of just basics of humanity of being happy and wanting to feel that connection with the ocean so yeah i love this photo there's a lot of joy in this shot you, yeah. you can just feel it you know um one of the questions i'm getting here in the chat is do you shoot the sl3 in the ocean with your subjects <laughs> yes so okay so i don't recommend not not don't try it at home but uh, I'm really, really, really confident in the ocean. On this particular day, I was shooting in the water, but, you know, given the conditions, you can see it's quite flat behind him. So I'm about waist deep in the water with the SL3 and I used the um, tilt screen on this shot so I could get low, but not have to be, you know, easily retract the camera up if, if needed. Um, I have been dying to get a water housing. Um, I've only ever borrowed water housings of friends, but I'm looking to get a water housing for the SL3 just because it's incredible. And I'm really, really excited to see what I might be able to get with the housing. But this particular, this particular photo was in the water, but totally not in the ocean. It was just standing in the, in the water from like the waist down. It's nice to have a tilt screen in these moments. That's, that's yeah. why we put it in tilt there. Screen. <laughs> well, I didn't have tried it with any other camera, I will say. So we have some more images here. And uh, you mentioned uh, in a previous discussion that the image on the left was shot with the 24 to 90 lens that you've been speaking about. But the image on the right was shot with an M lens, the 75 Nautilux. It's a, a favorite of mine and John's. We talk about this lens very often. How is your experience with uh, this lens here? 
Yeah, that lens is the most incredible lens ever. I it's really hard to compete with that lens. I was really, really grateful to be able to uh, borrow that lens from a friend. And um, I've been primarily, aside from the 24 to 90, using different um, converters for the lenses and switching out between M lenses, screw lenses, and kind of just playing around with that. But this is a portrait of my sister with uh, her Elias or Ford, so similar to what the boys had um, in the previous images. And it was incredibly, I was trying to shoot wide open, incredibly hard to nail the focus, but so worth it. I mean, the detail, the bokeh, especially on other images that I got of her as well, are just like, you know, uncomparable. And the softness that it kind of communicates and lends to like the whole story of the image that you're trying to make was amazing. That lens is beyond. It's It's beautiful. So incredible. Absolutely. And then we have some more, some close-ups, um, which we haven't shared yet, but I love this image. I love the movement in the water in particular. Could you share a little more about how you got this shot? Yeah. So this is another image with the tilt lens. So I'm able to get the camera really close to the surface of the water while being able to maneuver around and see what I'm, what I'm shooting, which I've never really tried to get an image like this before because I don't want to get the camera close to the ocean. But this is an instance that the tilt lens was was very, very useful. And um, I think this photo is, and again, when we're talking about what's going on in the background and what's not in focus sometimes ends up being the most beautiful, is definitely a case of this image, like the bokeh was, and the detail in the bokeh, the quality was like incredible. And then beyond that, when I took the photo and then I brought it up and I took it to the about 90% zoom, it's like the quality is as if you took it with, you know, like it's the full frame. It's it's insane. You you really see when you look at that photo and you zoom in, everything is so crisp. You can see every piece of pollen and it's as if that was the image itself. Um, and that's something that has been really incredible to work with, especially doing portraiture of people because it's it's amazing like imagine in hundreds of years receiving an image of your great 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 grandfather grandmother and then being able to see every single scar you know spot sunspot this and that and all of these things and wondering like wow what was that what was the story behind this look at her wrinkles or look at the color of her skin and all of these things which i think is so cool and i i feel super honored to be able to capture and document with that kind of quality. Absolutely. We're gonna to transition to a different space on Hawaii here, a couple of images coming up here. Uh, could you share a little more about what's going on? Yeah, so, um, so in Hawaii, um, our cosmology, which we call Puerto Rican, it's called the Kumulipo. So it's a story about how the world was created. And it's a very, very, very long chant. It's thousands of lines long. Um, and it speaks about all of these different generations of how things in the natural world progressed. And when it finally trickles all the way down and it gets to Kanakamali to people, um, it talks about Halo Anaka. So Halo Anaka Lao Kapalili is the older brother to the first Hawaiian. And he was born still and where he was buried from that site grew the first kalo plant. So this leaf that we have here in this image is the leaf of the kalo. And relating that to the physical world that we live in, kalo is the main source of sustenance for Polynesians, you know, throughout all of Pacifica, um, all Pacifica peoples, and especially in Hawaii, that's what we used to, and still used to make poi. And that was the main sustenance that people used as they were traveling all the way across Polynesia to Tahiti, to Aotearoa, you know, Rapa Nui, that's what sustained people throughout that whole thing. So it's extremely important and it should be regarded as our ancestor, but not only just an ancestor, the ancestor. So when you look at this plant, I think people in Hawaii, you know, who, who know the story, and I think most people do, 
um, they they kind of relate to that with a fondness. That's at least how I see it. So here we have um, some very good friends of mine. They're my little cousins, Lai Ula and Manavai Olanolan. And these girls are incredible. I, I love to see them all the time because they're, they just have that spirit of young Hawaiian kids that are just crack up, cheeky, funny, always smiling, laughing and playing. But they're really doing a lot to uphold our, our culture. And they just uh, finished school yesterday. So they had this thing, which we call in Hawaii, like your whole Ike for school, which is kind of like a showing of what they did through their school year. And they perform certain hula with their classes. So these girls are, you know, learning about their culture at this present moment. And I'm really excited to see what they do as they grow. So this is them here in Hanalei Valley. Um, and Hanalei is a famous vahipana, especially for kalo and growing kalo. So if you come to Hawaii and you ever have poi, have Hanalei poi. It's really good. Um, but yeah, so these are the girls working in the lo'i and pulling some kalo. And yeah, this particular image kind of was similar to the one of my dad and the three boys in the sense that there was a lot of stoic, beautiful imagery, but this was more representative of their personalities. Um, and so that was the one that I just decided to pull and highlight because um, it's showing kind of the past and the future and the excitement and, you know, the bright future that's kind of ahead. I love that. Beautiful. We have some more close-up work and another portrait. Um, is this somebody doing a hula? Yep. So this is my uh, friend, Halen Chalk, who, you know, I was really grateful of her to let me photograph her um, performing this hula. It was at sunrise in a place that's very special to her. Um, and I met up with her that morning and it was pretty impromptu, but we just decided that she was going to do a hula that was very special to her. It was a hula that she learned on really early in her life. And so it was something that was really significant and special to her. So a um, little bit of context on hula. I think a lot of people have seen hula in some way, shape or form or have maybe visited Hawaii and seen it or it's been made really popular in cinema by Elvis and all these kinds of people. But um, hula is an art form and it demands a lot of respect studying people commit their lives to hula and it's this art form that I have so much respect for because there's so many um things you have to learn as far as the dance that you're going to perform okay well what is the song and what is the song about where is the song talking about what are the plants in the song okay well we're going to go to that place we're going to see the plants we're going to feel what's going on in that space and we're going to embody that when we're dancing. And so every single move is a way of telling a story. Um, and so with these photos, it's like taking a, taking a photo, which is a story of somebody already telling a story. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really something that is so beautiful to see. And I really, really respect and, and adore people like Hey Lynn, because beyond being an incredible dancer, she's also an incredible person that's you know, dedicating all of her time and her interests to um, protecting Hawaii and making it a better place. And I'm glad that we were able to show that in the video as well. There's some of her dancing that's showcased and it's really, really beautiful. Yeah. This is another different space. Uh, we were talking about this space a couple of days ago. It seems very calming. And, and you mentioned that it's, very, it's a very quiet space. Do you mind describing a little bit more? Yeah. So this um, place here is honestly, when you go to Hawaii and it's this, you know, tropical kind of place that I think a lot of people perceive to be like a tropical paradise. I think uh, for me, even though I love the kai and I love surfing and all these things, this is a space that I love the most. And this is up Mauka on Kauai and uplands in the um, forest. And these types of places are in these high elevations that are able to have native life that are undeterred by, you know, hotels, development, roads, 
Um, this particular place is protected so there can't be any roads through this coastline. And um, to me, you know, when you're in this place, it is what we call in Hawaii the Vawakua. So it's the area and the, the place that the Akua or the gods reside. And not only does that have to do with them physically dwelling there, but it also gives off a connotation of how we should behave when we're in these spaces. And so these types of trees here are um, the type of foliage that the native birds inhabit. And so Hawaii, thankfully, we have a less amount of predators than other islands in Hawaii currently have today. So our populations of birds, native birds, are still quite intact, but it's comparatively. They're still certainly endangered, and there are very few of certain species left. But thankfully, it's places like this that allow them to still exist. So this is one of my most favorite places. Um, and it's something that you're not really going to think of when you think of Hawaii. But when I have these photos and I photograph certain things, you know, say, if you're looking at it in generations from now, you're like, wow, why did Tutu take a photo of this place? Like she must have really loved it and must have meant this. And so this kind of space, when you're standing in it, it feels so quiet. Everything is quiet. You can almost hear the mist hitting the leaves. And you really, really feel like you're in a place that is beyond yourself. And it's so, especially if you can be there with, you know, nobody else around, which we're very, very fortunate to still be able to have that today. Um, but this is a place that really brings me personally uh, a lot of peace and a lot of gratitude for what we have. And you were mentioning that this is a space that, you know, cars can't get to, like you have to hike and, and and get to this place yourself. Uh, there's no really roads that lead up to this space. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it's a part of a coastline that's um, about, I think, 15 or 17 miles long. That's just intraversible in any other way aside from walking or uh, swimming, taking a boat, kayaking, um, which really, really lucky and fortunate to still have these spaces where these stories when I when I know these mo'olala and these stories that are taking places taking place in these places, you feel like they're still alive because they still have that that feeling of being untouched, and you feel like you can feel the spirits just just around the corner. And that's what's really magical to me about this place. And what's really magical about storytelling, which is what I think always draws me to storytelling, is its ability to enrich places and take it beyond a surface level. And when I think things are enriched in that way, people feel that emotional connection to them. It it really pushes us to protect these spaces that need our protection and need our responsible guidance. Absolutely. We're gonna show one last black and white image from this series here. I, I do have a couple questions on your black and white work. Um, one of the questions is, how do you create? Do you do you have looks? Do you have presets that you use? Do you edit them one by one? What is your process for black and white photography? I I have a certain preset that I kind of have developed and like worked with throughout the years. And it actually is now that I think about it, it's been a long time and I, I kind of tweak and play with it. I really like having like quite a bit of contrast and also quite a bit of like grain. I just like to whatever I can do to diminish a kind of really constructive digital feeling, I will, because I feel like personally just, I love very natural things. So, so yeah, I, I, I have been working with this, a couple of different presets and things um, for a while now, but I will edit one by one, especially if it's images that I really like. Um, it takes me a while because I I feel like I'm just, you know, pretty indecisive sometimes when it comes to black and white. But yeah, I do like to go one by one and really take my time. And, you know, like you've been describing, these images are important. So you want to take your time. You don't want to rush things. This is something that, like you've been describing, will be passed down to generations as uh, an archive, as a way for you to witness what's going on. So it's important for you to 
you know, develop the, the, the correct way, so to speak, as far as getting those images out, how you see it. Um, so I, I totally align with what you're saying. I feel like it is important to take your time. You know, post-production is part of photography. Capturing is just the beginning of it. And then you can do so much in the edit. And then that's a very important part. Yeah, you can do so much. I, I've been, I know later on next month, you guys are going to have a talk like this with uh, Jason Roman. Who yes, also indeed. SL3. And I've been able to chat with him quite a bit about his process. That's a great, if you're going to attend Roman's seminar, you should definitely ask him that question because that man has a crazy workflow for editing. He's got like such a beautiful eye for post production. And honestly, I feel like he really communicates so much of his story with his color. And I've learned a lot from him and I still have a lot to learn. Like I'm very, very, very basic compared to Roman, but that's an excellent question. And if you don't know Jason Roman, you should definitely check out his work. He's incredible. Absolutely. The talk will be on June 6th. All right, we're going to, you know, we've been talking a little bit about different parts of Hawaii and we're returning here in these last three images to the ocean. Um, what can you say about these shots right here? Is this also a, a, a photograph of your sister? Yeah, this is a photograph of my sister again with her alaya. And the reason why I like this image, obviously compositionally, it's really interesting with just the linear direction in all different levels. Um, obviously there you have the Kahakai, the beach with the sand, then you have ocean and then you have sky. But to me, uh, this photo is significant because the size of my sister here is quite small. And that ocean behind her is quite literally something that she would be amongst in a heartbeat at any given moment in any given day. Um, and so it is kind of representative of like, the smallness that we are compared to the ocean that I think all Polynesian people have an understanding of, you know, the ocean is something that's not to be conquered, not to be altered with, just respected, but you can be a part of it. And, um, and to me, when I think of this photo, it's so crazy to think that something as rough as that, as humans, we have the capability thanks to so many years of generations have passed down intergenerational knowledge and wisdom from our elders that we have almost a superhuman ability to go out into these huge waves, surf these huge waves and come back um, totally fine and, and want to do it again. So so the, the scale of this photo is really what kind of drew me towards this composition. And did you also use the 24 to 90, perhaps in the 75 or 90 range to get the compression that you've been talking about to really accentuate that uh, difference between the sizes? Yeah, I was standing up on a hill for this one. So I was quite far back as she was crossing and I was a little bit obviously elevated up too. So you could see the, the different layers and you didn't get like just the plain horizon. You were able to see the scope of the ocean in the layers of how far out the waves are breaking. I think if you look in the far right corner, you can literally see this wave is breaking maybe a mile out from shore. And just thinking about the raw power of the ocean coming in all the way to where she's at. Beautiful. And we end with two sunset shots. I felt that there was uh, very thematic for this, this conversation as we, <laughs> as we enter our talk here. I love the silhouettes, but we've been talking about the bokeh, the background. This is another shot where I feel like this works really well. I mean, to have the waves crash behind your subject here and those little, you know, flurries of light bouncing on uh, the water is just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I think that what I really liked about this photo is there's so much life and movement. In Hawaii, I think the number one thing that I'm in awe of all the time, and I think it's something that I take for granted until I go to other places in the world and you know, going into cities and stuff is like, you lack that, that physical power, like the mana of the places that you're in. Like if you look at the ocean behind her is roaring, the shore break behind her, just one foot from shore, is roaring. You see the texture of the water hitting her, her legs. Her hair is blowing in the wind. Like that, that power is, is the, is the everything in life to me. And that's, 
it's like what people would akin to magic I think to me that's the closest thing and um I think it really embodies this person that she is and her mana within this greater place and being able to like embody and move between these spaces was really cool and and the lighting just before um the sunset it was was really beautiful and really made the images so crisp um especially in another silhouette that I did of her um had a similar thing yeah so this image as I was kind of describing before cropping in on these SL3 images and still having incredible quality and resolution is quite literally this photo like this image the original was a huge wide image of her and I I thought that her profile was really powerful and so I just decided that we're going to focus on that and this is I I can't recall what the crop was but this is very very cropped in and when you look at the photo in real life and you look at it um printed or on you know a screen it's still like beautiful and impeccable quality what really marked me for this shot is the the calmness the stillness and especially in, in comparison to the image that we just saw uh where there's all this energy coming from the the ocean you can still see the ocean in this particular image but the subject really conveys this idea of, of calmness of stillness which i really appreciate within the context of this roaring ocean behind her. Uh, I really think that's really beautiful. And of course, you get the sun. So you have this natural gradation from where the subject is on the right-hand side of the image, and then it gradually gets darker and darker and darker, again, bringing back your eyes to, to that subject. Yeah. Really beautiful. Well, Mayne, I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, there's still an opportunity for people to ask questions in the chat. But um, thank you so much for taking the time to show us and to share with us. Um, I want to share with the team, I'm sorry, the guests, uh, some of the Academy workshops that we're doing uh, here at Leica. Um, if you want to learn more about Leica cameras and including the new Leica SL3, we do have classes in person and online. You can use the QR code on the slide right here to sign up to a particular class that you may want to attend. And we also have classes all around the United States, uh, ranging from the East Coast with uh, Jim Sullivan photographing spaces, uh, Mission Star spaces, both food and the restaurant themselves. We have uh, workshops in Texas. It's going to be great for the summer, as well as workshops on the West Coast as well. And you can find all that out by going to our website and selecting the different Leica Academy workshops. It's a great way for you to learn more about the craft of photography, but also uh, the camera that you are using. I'm going to end on this slide right here. This is a great way for you to connect with uh, Maine uh, through her Instagram. You can also connect uh, with us through Instagram at, uh, at Leica Camera USA and at Leica Academy USA. Maine. Thank you again so much for your time, for sharing your images. Uh, it was really great speaking with you today. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was super fun. I'm honored. We'll talk soon, folks. And until next time, which will be on June 6th with Jason Roman, we'll see you in the next one.